and Brian for hosting this exciting event at Glendon, and also Dominique, Diana, and Valkyr for the opening remarks, and my, my colleagues Marta and Cecilia and Pita for the uh, very interesting presentations. And it's a privilege to be here and to have you as listeners and interlocutors. Um, as uh, you will say I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Sao Paulo. I work under the supervision of Climario, and I'm also a teaching assistant in anthropology at the Institute of Brazilian Studies at the University of Sao Paulo too. The purpose of my talk today is to briefly reflect upon the role translation plays in the challenges we face when trying to build a common vocabulary in transnational efforts. I was inspired by accounts related to two specific large-scale development projects associated with environmental controversies. One in Brazil, in the state of Pará, which is where I come from. Um, one in northern Manitoba, here in Canada. And more specifically, I found myself wondering whether the Fox Lake Cree Nation that confronted Manitoba Hydro <coughs> and the indigenous Amazonian peoples opposing the Belo Monte complex could translate across their differences, bond in a Panamerindian fashion, find mutually a, a mutually emancipatory ground and work towards modes of trans-hemispheric agenda formation. Before I move on towards giving a brief account of those controversies, please allow me to clarify what I mean by building a common vocabulary, finding common ground, and the role translation plays in those processes. I believe that common vocabularies and common grounds are never common in the sense that they are not given but progressively composed. And the same stands true for what we could refer to as a common world. French philosopher Bruno Latour, in his 2002 inspirational article, War of the Worlds, argues that, and I quote, the common world is not behind us and ready-made, but ahead of us, an immense task which we need to accomplish one step at a time. Now, one of Latour's uh, main interlocutors throughout the last decade has been Eduardo Viveiros de Castro, arguably Brazil's most celebrated ethnologist these days. And Viveiros de Castro has proposed the notion of translational equivocation, which I believe is one of the most interesting Brazilian recent developments within translation theory and potentially a great contribution to those studying cross-cultural meaning-making processes. His ultimate goal was to assert that native discourses should transform anthropological discourses and that anthropological theories should be versions of native theories. In a 2004 article called Perspectival Anthropology and the Method of Controlled Equivocation, he talks about equivocation as a fundamental tenet of comparability within and across cultures, advocating for it as a tool of objectification, not a subjective failure, error, deception, or lie. And translating, he argues, has to do with controlling equivocations. Control, and I quote, in the sense that walking may be said to be a controlled way of falling. Now, I think it would be interesting to locate the First Nations and the Amazonians' attempts to forge trans and meridian bonds uh, in order to oppose hydroelectric projects within the broad context of translational equivocation. 
one could say that environmental controversies are essentially global, global in nature, for they make clear that we share a common world. But for the peoples inhabiting the surroundings of Manitoba Hydro in the Fox Lake Resource Management Area and in Belo Monte, in Pará, translating across the same things, such as what one conceives of as environment, for instance, does not happen without equivocations. Composing a common world does not happen without equivocations. This occurred to me when I heard about a particular event that took place in 2011 in Foz do Iguaçu, in the state of Paraná, southern Brazil, when Cree, former chief and also actor, Michael Laurenchuk of the Fox Lake Reserve in northern Manitoba was effusively applauded for speaking at the International Hydro... Sorry, got uh, a little bit lost here. Okay, speaking at the International Hydropower Association Conference held there in Foz do Iguaçu in June. He was acclaimed for telling how he mediated a settlement between Creek communities, the province of Manitoba, and Manitoba Hydro in 2009, after years of horrendous suffering brought by the utility. Lauren Chuck emphasized that making sure that the benefits that hydroelectric power provides are shared with all the peoples is something that's paramount to the partnership that he helped to forge. Let's watch a video and hear what he had to say in an interview that he gave during the that conference. When, when, I first, when I first came to the Congress, I was, I was uh, a little afraid, um, being from a First Nation that deals with, uh, with, with hydropower. Uh, but uh, sitting in on the, on the sessions and, and talking with the people, I, 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 um, I became very um, impressed at, uh, at what, was, what, was, what was happening within the conference. Um, I think that any time uh, uh, business people and, and ordinary people get together to talk, about uh, about hydro development, I think uh, we can only end up at a better place. So um, this has been a very very positive experience for me, meeting um, um, representatives of uh, the power industry from all over the world. One of the things that, that I, I think we need to do as as a collective, uh, um, uh, the hydro corporations and, and, and the, the investors and, and uh, the public, uh, the, the the stakeholders and and the uh, the people that are concerned about the environment and uh, and. Uh, effects on, on people. One of the things that, that we need to do is we need, we need to make sure that the benefits that hydro provides uh, is, is, is given to all the people. And I think that's one of the challenges that, that, that we're, we're facing right now. We're, we're certainly dealing with uh, the less than favorable um, um, ways in which we, uh, we did things in the past. And which we're, we're, we're trying to learn from and we're trying to fix. So, so I think it's, it's incredibly important that, that we talk to each other about sustainability. In our province, high, well, um, hydropower is very important to our province because we're, we're, we're a province that, 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 that has beautiful or very powerful rivers. And, and uh, one of the ways in which we generate uh, benefits and economy in our province is, is, is through the hydro dams. We do export into the United States and, and the province, other provinces, so it's, it's, a, it's a means by which we can generate revenue for, for all of Manitoba. I think that will become clearer the more we talk. Um, I, I know that uh, uh, the sessions that we're having, we're, we're, we're discussing where we, where we want to end up and how we want to end up uh, at, at these places, so, so I think uh, more of these kind of sessions are, are required for us to, to to uh, define where we're going to go, but also to adapt to the, the obstacles that, are, that, that we're facing at, um, in various parts of the world. Find a way to, uh, to talk uh, to the people that are bringing the projects in. Find a, find a way that, 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 that your voice can be heard and your voice can be respected. And, and, and not only that, that, uh, that you have access to uh, uh, the proper resources so that you can make an informed, informed decision on what's going to happen and what's going to change your life.
So what under, underlies Lauren Chuck's satisfaction with the benefits provided by hydropower to all the people in Manitoba, as he says, wow. What underlies his satisfaction differs a lot from the numerous protests by the indigenous peoples living where Belo Monte is being built in the Amazon, along the Xingu River. So Laurenchuk did receive a standing ovation for making clear that we can only end up in a better place when business people and ordinary people get together, as he says in the video. Um, but in Brazil, he performed as a bulwark of cross-cultural understanding of the commonness of benefits, of the commonness of generating revenue for Manitoba as a whole, of the best interest of human beings, not necessarily other species, right? And after all, of, of the better, best interest of all those sharing a Pan Amerindian identity. That's why he was invited by the International Hydropower Association. That's why he was invited to speak before engineers, businessmen, politicians, bankers, NGOs, representatives, and researchers involved in the hydropower industry. But the first question such an account brought to my mind was, would the politics of compensation like that suffice for Amerindian peoples in living in the Amazonian? Well, the various indigenous communities who are bearing the brunt of Belo Monte in Pará were also represented at the conference. Sheila Yakarepi from the Juruna community was there and declared that such a partnership is unimaginable in their case. There will be a fight, she said. We will not let Belo Monte be built since the project, according to her, does not respect the country's laws and violates human rights. Let's hear what, what she has to say about Belo Monte. It's a shorter video, shorter than that one. O projeto Belo Monte representa para mim, para o meu povo, o um empreendimento de destruição e morte, de dizimação total das nossas populações e de toda a biodiversidade. O projeto Belo Monte terá grandes consequências para o nosso povo na questão ambiental, territorial e, especialmente, o nosso rio que será totalmente modificado, comprometendo toda a nossa vida. Já tentamos de várias formas de diálogo com o governo usando todas as medidas para impedir esse empreendimento. Então, não fomos ouvidos. Acredito que devemos partir agora para a luta, para a guerra mesmo, contra Belo Monte. Não, não mais no diálogo, partir agora para fazer ações mais firmes mesmo, de resistência contra esse empreendimento que vem para destruir toda a vida do Xingu e das nossas populações indígenas que, que aqui habitam. Que o mundo possa estar divulgando a questão de Belo Monte, divulgar a realidade que ela vai causar, a desgraça mesmo que esse impedimento vai trazer para a nossa região, que não será desenvolvimento, será sim destruição e morte. There is a, a stark contrast at play between what Sheila says and what Lauren Chuck says. In order to discuss that contrast and to explain what Viveiro de Castro means by translational equivocation, I would like to briefly introduce how the theories of South American peoples, South, South American indigenous people, sorry, that he studied in his field work motivated him to develop a translation of the indigenous thought that he called Amerindian perspectivism, which is widely spread within anthropological studies today. Viveiro de Castro aims to translate the indigenous conceptual imagination in the terms of our own conceptual imagination, because our terms, our categories, he says, are the only ones available to us. But 
Amerindian perspectivism, and I quote, is a label for a set of ideas and practices found throughout indigenous America. This Amerindian set of ideas and practices may appear a little bit complex at first glance, especially for those of us who are not anthropologists, but I believe it's worth considering it. That's why I'll try to sum it up in a nutshell. There are no point, points of view onto things. Things and beings are the points of view themselves. Perspectivism is about a difference of perspective, not a plur plurality of views of a single world, which we, one could say in a relativist fashion, but a single view of different worlds in a relationist fashion. And for example, what jaguars see as many of beer, which is what the boys drink in there, humans see as blood. So, but what does Ivanovich Castro mean by that? He means that any species of subject perceives itself and its world the same way we perceive ourselves and our world. And the other of the others is always other. Culture, according to American perspectivism, is what one sees of oneself when one says, I. But what translation theory originates from Amerindian perspectivism. For Vivendus de Castro, what should emerge when two different types of subjective agencies translate across each other is a relationship of epistemological equivalence between two discourses. Now, how do we translate, how do we compose a common world across transnational differences? We should translate and compose a common world by placing our terms in dangerous relationships, as Rivera de Castro says. We should do that by exposing our terms, unsettling our categories, by betraying them, by being conscious of our own equivocations, and deliberately betraying our conceptual two box. For, according to him, a good translation allows the alien concepts to deform and subvert the translator's conceptual toolbox so that the intention of the original language can be expressed within the new one. Viveros de Castro also says that the anthropologist's task is an endless effort to promote intercultural translation by cobbling together disparate elements connecting diverse fragments so as to provide them with extra meaning. L'Ectopricolor, presented by Claude Lévis in his 1962 book, La Pensée Sauvage, The Savage Mind. This image of, translator, of, of translation as bricolage, of the translator as a bricoleur, reminds me of the paradigm of translation as metonymic, presented by University of Massachusetts professor Maria Chimosko in her book, Translation in a Postcolonial Context. She argues that all literary, literary texts evoke metonymically the larger contexts from which they emerge. She says that constructing texts that metonymically stand <coughs> for the culture of marginalized peoples inevitably privileges certain metonymies over others and that translators, creates, that translators create images of their source cultures in a process that has important ideological implication, implications. According to her paradigm, translators select some elements, some aspects, or some parts of the source text to highlight and preserve. Translators prioritize and privilege some parameters and not others and thus, translators represent some aspects of the source text partially or fully, or others not at all in a translation. By definition, 
translations metonymic is a form of representation in which parts or aspects of the source text comes to, come to stand for the whole. Well, um, just to conclude, I would like to say that I believe Viveiro de Castro takes one step further in tackling the matter of parts and holes in translation and cross-cultural meaning making. What the notion of equivocation shows us is that if we presume that other peoples also work with a distinction between parts and holes, we should at least acknowledge that they have different modes of conceiving of parts and holes. What I mean is, Lauren Czech's metonymies are not Shayla's metonymies. Lauren Czech's, Lauren Czech's bricolage are not Shayla's bricolage. And also, as the American anthropologist Roy Wagner, who is also a long-term interlocutor of Viveiros de Castro, said about his relations with one of the people he studied, the Daribi, from Papua New Guinea, and I quote, their misunderstanding of me was not the same as my misunderstanding of them. One could say, that the First Nations' misunderstanding of the Amazonians is not the same as the Amazonians' misunderstanding of the First Nations. Those misunderstandings or equivocations are the limiting condition of every effort to build a common vocabulary, a common ground, a common world, and of every translation. And still, ironically, this provides with us with a rather optimistic take on Panamerindianism and cross-cultural meaning-making, I think. This might come out as a paradox, but what makes the translation between the First Nations and the Amerindians possible is precisely the fact that their discoursers are not saying the same thing. Thanks a lot, guys.